and welcome to crafts and crime i'm amy i'm elaine and as always we have a craft and a crime yay so we um i am actually waiting on a package i'm really excited now i can talk about it but um <laughs> my husband does uh he mixes music like he used to dj and stuff and um and the sound system in the garage because he has a whole setup in the garage with his turntables and everything. Mm-hmm. And well, I know. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know, you've seen it. You've been, you've been in my garage. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, uh, he's got a whole setup. Well, I think one night he just got a little too um, loud with the speakers and blew the subwoofer. Because uh-huh. it's so, old, right? Yeah, it's old. And they don't sell the the whole thing anymore. Well, it's a whole lot easier just to find a used subwoofer. And so I'm really hoping it works because the subwoofer powers all the speakers. And he has it like our garage is an average size garage. Yeah. And so he has it all throughout the like wired up throughout the garage. So does he really? I, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I paid attention yeah, to that part. Yeah, speakers. Like he's got the whole setup um, in front of that big desk thing that he built. So uh-huh. he's got like three speaker, three speakers there. And I think a couple like one behind the door like on the other side of that shelf Mm -hmm. he's got a few like all over but all the wires run to the subwoofer and Mm -hmm. that is what broke and so i found one on Mm -hmm. makari for like 25 bucks yeah i'm really hoping it works i had to pay 30 dollars in shipping because it's so heavy heavy yeah and um the older they are the heavier too yeah (laughs) and so it was a whole hell of a lot cheaper to do that than to get a whole thing and so he's been having a rough week (laughs) at work and stuff and i mean you know what happened the week prior with that one guy it's, it's just it's been a, it's been a, a bit work is work <laughs> work is work but it's worse when there's drama involved and people being stupid and um so yeah there's a dumb criminal <laughs> oh this freaking co-worker that just spazzed out and got arrested um so i am anxiously waiting for ups to pull up and any second that off i know i was trying you get their websites all messed up but i'm really excited because He's just laying on the couch right now, relaxing. And he was like, I don't know if I'm going to go. I guess Gabe's DJing a show um, somewhere. Does and... he work tomorrow? No. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Kurt works, but Jack doesn't yeah. now. So he was going to go with Randy or whatever. So they might. He's like, I don't know. I got to see how I feel because he's still dealing with all the back issues. You know, he's just not feeling 100%. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, well, I got a surprise for you. And I think I know what you're going to do all weekend. <laughs> and Yay. Which it's been months since right it's been it's been a while i don't know it was like before summer everybody's like really hot, tired hot. we haven't been hanging out in the garage <laughs> no and it's been <laughs> hot. hot so it was before <clears throat> it, it was so it's been months that mm-hmm. it's been out and um so i'm excited to get that for him and get them all That'd back be in because it's a you know music is um a good release for tension and you know i i yes. myself i play a lot of instruments um and I just know even listening to music can put me in a different headspace and so I I know that's Mm -hmm. for him it's a good stress reliever you know go in the garage have a few beers and and make some music and so it's been a while so yeah I mean I don't love hearing it (laughs) all the time because it's like I mean he does a lot of jungle and drum and bass but um you know I've it's been 15 years. I'm used to it. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm not forced to go out there and listen to it. I just have to hear the the bass, you know, from inside the house yeah. and text him at like one in the morning, like, dude, turn it down. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, now that it's cooling down and we can actually like hang out and the guys can go do their thing. And you then... guys got to fix that door. I know. I know we do. We just don't have. We're going to pull my garage together, too. And I know it won't mm-hmm. be the same thing, but it'll be another fun space that we can move back to back once we fix the fence. I know. But now the weather's cooling down. We can go outside and really do it. It's. Yeah. It was, as we've mentioned, we the kids got sunburns on Easter. Mm-hmm. It's been hot forever. And then we had like a weird June that was like way too cool for June. Mm-hmm. We had because, a lot of rainy days. And now it's just way too hot for existence. Yeah. <laughs> but it's I'm cooling like, down It's finally. October. Why is it so hot still? Mm-hmm. But I mean, I know every Halloween I'm like sweating <laughs> <laughs> while I take yeah. all the kids trick or treating. So um, yeah, it's still hot, but I'm ready for fall weather. It's sl- it's like up and down, and it's like and it's the like 80s, and then it's the I'm 70s, literally like, like looking 90. at the weather, going, "What day can I make boiling hot soup?" I know. Well, What's you made the coolest day. Yeah, I made French onion mm-hmm. soup n- uh, yes, the day before, day before because yeah. I was gonna do beef stew, but I ended up not. Yeah, um, and I did it yesterday. Yeah. 
yeah beef stew is my go-to and then um yeah french onion soup that's next on my list but i'm waiting for like a cold day and i'm like there's really no it was supposed to be colder this week and then it adjusted to being like mild yeah it's a high of 73 today and then (laughs) rude yeah but then next week it's gonna be like 84 86 (sighs) next sunday Huh, what? Happy 80, November. 81 on Halloween. Yep. Yeah, because we're still not Fuck to Halloween. Bullshit. <laughs> yeah, that's how far in advance we record. Oh, yeah. But, um, ooh, we did get a little bit of um, drama on our street. We, um, the kids, <laughs> I got a really cute picture of Calvin in that window with the that cop was car. Super cute. It's, it's nothing. Oh, and then today, this morning, there was like a fire truck and an ambulance. I think it's for the house down the street. Oh, I saw them so, go by because I was like, why? I hear something really loud yeah. and fast coming down yeah. this street. We have a super old, narrow street. This, yeah. This it's area like was only built one, in the 50s. It's yeah. Like one car, one at, car a at a time. Yeah. <laughs> there's, you're playing chicken. If there's two of you coming from each end, you have to who's like going to pull side. off to the side? Yeah. And the way people drive down here, it is unbelievable. Oh gosh, people they have no idea... Down. If someone is turning on that street. No. And it's crazy because you said there's never been a major accident. No. No, and there was over here. Yeah. But um, not at directly. The, at the in front house of us. at the very end, the corner, not in front of us, but in the corner mm-hmm. over here, a car lost control, probably going too fast coming. So that direction. Okay. So, <laughs> so I'm still this, not familiar. It's been street, a year. So here, this street yes. here. So on our side, uh-huh. that corner house, someone was coming this way mm-hmm. and went up through, you know how they have that big white gate yeah. right there? Went through that into their garage. A oh, car did. So that that street, people fly down a lot. But yeah, our street's very small, residential, and there are some people that are just man, they fly down the street. And, there's and a you lot are of kids. barely getting anywhere any fast. No, I mean, when are it's you a ever? Short street. Yeah, too. when are you ever? But like on the edges of the street, because of the building that's at the very end of the road. Everyone is stopping. Like, there's mm-hmm. no... It's not saving you any time. So, it's not even like, it's a shortcut through a neighborhood so I don't have to hit every red light. Mm-hmm. It makes no sense logically. And I think they're only driving down that fast because they don't know any better. I don't notice a lot of the same vehicles doing it. I do. There's a couple. Really? Yeah. There's like a silver one that goes down So, that's why fast. they keep doing it mm-hmm. because there's never been a consequence. And there's always that really loud car. You know, that, that really, really loud, like, loud sputtering car. engine one. It almost sounds like a motorcycle, but Across it's a car. The street. It's not that one, I don't think. Oh, there's another I one. I thought somebody had a motorcycle, but Kurt was like, "No, it's that beetle." And I was like, "Are you sure?" Yeah, I know the sound of the beetle because they've been there ever since sputtery. we've been here. Um, but yeah, there there was some there was a lot going on. There was that one week, like a week or so ago, where there was all the cops on our street. There was like two oh, cop yeah. cars, the ambulance, yeah, the yeah, fire yeah. truck. There was like all this stuff. But like, I think it was like happening? two separate things. I think what so I think. too. It was two separate incidences. The cops were at one, one end, and the ambulance and, and the fire uh-huh. was at the other. I think it's an elderly, um, mm-hmm. like person at the end of the street yeah. because they. Anytime we see it, it's like, oh, I know what house because they're always parked yeah. down there. And it's crazy um, because my downstairs neighbor a long time ago had that with her um, elderly mom. And mm-hmm. oh my gosh, the fire department ambulance, they'll come every week. They came there yeah. to come every week because they understand also it's a transport mm-hmm. thing as well. If you are uh, medically indigent, you don't have a way to get to wherever you need or you are too sick to go, mm-hmm. you know? So it's just crazy. But you'll eventually realize it's the same. Yeah. Person. I never know if they take the person or if they mm-hmm. show up. They're to just assist or whatever but um yeah so we aid. had that this week and then we had the cops fly up in front of you like because oh you know God. we're neighbors so yeah <laughs> it's like my driveway is you know right by yours uh-huh. and um <laughs> and so i saw a cop car pull up in front of elaine's house and i was like what the heck like they had and a then, purpose which yeah, is weird it was fast and mm-hmm. then another car pulled up and blocked my driveway <laughs> not like i needed to go anywhere but i was like that's illegal. Locked my van in, yeah. <laughs> so they pulled up and they were going to the house across the street. Yeah. And it's not the first time. No. Um, so we kind of knew what was going on. Mm-hmm. Um, just domestic stuff. but And it's hard to not hear it because I was making my French onion soup. <laughs> and I was in the caramelization part. And I was like. With your window open. I have to stir yeah. it. So I'm just standing here like, I swear, I'm not really trying to look. But oh, I'm we were. just here. <laughs> I get it. It's hard not to. Like, it's right there. It's not yeah. like we're at the end of the street peeking out. It's literally in front of our house. Yeah. Um. 
and I was kind of and like I had all my windows open because it was that yeah. really cool day yes that we it was had. a beautiful day mm-hmm. it was like the coolest day I knew we were gonna have so mm-hmm. I was making Which this hot soup. soup yep exactly <laughs> yeah. and it was just odd the the way that the police were handling the situation it was just very odd and then everybody left and the cops looked mad yeah nothing happened so yeah. I think they were frustrated with the situation because and the, something the, happened mm-hmm. you said you saw someone packing up stuff or yeah. whatever so I don't know mm-hmm. but it's just it's unfortunate um there's not much you know we could do other than i think jack called the cops at one time when he heard um a dispute thing happening Mm -hmm. you know just heard something happen we knew you kind of know if you hear something it's better to call than to just assume like everything's fine fine. um so yeah jack heard um something happening and so he i think he called it in um and i other neighbors have too i know the neighbor that we talked mm-hmm. to across the street i know she's yeah kind of said the and same it's thing crazy because it's like well, there's that one empty house now mm-hmm. and it's Ooh, just as cra- bad as people. living yeah and it's just as bad as like living in an apartment i was so lucky that the neighbors i had in my apartment from the moment we had moved in mm-hmm. um it we had the best roommates. We were so roommates. We had the best neighbors and we were so freaking Did you tell lucky. your friend about that house? Because I know you told her about the other house. I don't uh, remember which friend it was. No, no, I didn't because um, like it doesn't even have a mm, for mm-hmm. rent or anything. It's just vacant. It's it just says empty. Private, they could be private property. They could stuff. be selling it. Mm-hmm. Who knows? But. It could be in foreclosure. Probably. Oh, yeah. Um, probably. So, maybe for sure. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Totally. Maybe for sure. I bet you're right. Yeah. Um, and it's so stressful because it's like we can't just pick up and move and neighbors are scary. And I know there's riffraff here that wasn't because people are moving in and out. And so that mm-hmm. open house, I'm like, <laughs> it's moving in. I know. I, <laughs> it's stressful. It's like the we had a house sell across the street from us and it's mm-hmm. they're quiet. It's like a family with kids. Mm-hmm. Um, You know, I obviously have the best neighbor. No, <laughs> you're right. Yeah, we do. Nikolai's we got lucky. Pretty cool. Yeah, and so on either side of us, there's like super uh, cool neighbors. Yeah, they're really nice. The grandma will like send over yeah. stuff for the kids, and, and the little boys are so friendly. And he nice. is, he is. Is he had his moments when he was a little kid, but what little kid? You know, it's like it mm-hmm. it's just little kids are annoying sometimes. And he's but, also younger than them all. Yeah, so. and so he's closer to Avery's age than um than Troy. But he, mm-hmm. when my brother came over and he was doing the RC car, and yeah. my brother let him. Well, sure, let him do the RC car. He's a really sweet kid. So. Um. <clears throat> yeah, and they're like really good neighbors. So it's hard mm. to find good neighbors, and it, you when you it live is. in a neighborhood, you don't have a choice in who moves in. And we've oh, had gosh, if you buy a house and then you have like an asshole move in next dude, door, dude. Laughing dude, like that was some <laughs> drama at that house too. We called it the laughing guy house because his laugh was hilarious, and it, he was always hanging out on the front porch where their mm-hmm. door was open, and he yeah. sounded so funny. And it would, would always bust us him. up. It was so funny. Yeah, but they'd they be moved. sitting on the couch watching TV. <laughs> Laughing guys. Yeah. Hear him. <laughs> there he goes. There he goes. <laughs> but then I'm like, that's probably, we're, we're the new Laughing House houses. We absolutely are. We are you the most obnoxious, tackle. for yes. sure. <laughs> Well, the guys get together and they're just as bad. Oh, yeah. And like we sit outside because we're just hanging out outside to not be in the house. Mm-hmm. But get and our the, vitamin D. Yeah. And the guys hang out um, late into the evening and we don't force our neighbors to listen to music all night. No, we don't. <laughs> that is not just, us. Just got to listen to us laughing. Okay. You ready for your yeah. craft? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm super okay. excited. Good. So my, I had talked about this in an episode past in a little tiny bit i was like oh never mind never mind i mean i'm probably gonna end up covering it later mm-hmm. so i'm doing dollhouses oh yay <laughs> i'm so excited it was really fun it's and so funny because every time when we like hear the craft i'm like yeah. please don't let it be what oh, i'm working absolutely. on please don't, do don't let it be the one thing. i'm done with <laughs> like, oh, no. but dollhouses okay yeah because yeah, you're houses. working on yours now yes i'm right? working on one <clears> and <throat> i um, have made room boxes before that I really loved. And um, I completely disassembled all of them, though, because it was really bulky and it wasn't, like, level and stuff. So mm-hmm. I disassembled it and I'll redo it. But it was really fun. And I love it. Now I'm doing a big dollhouse and it's the bane of my existence. <laughs> I'm not good with those. The directions are just weird. But I will do it. And yeah. I'm working on the stained glass windows. And mm-hmm. they're giving me grief, too. But it's yeah. okay. Okay. So technically dollhouses are... A very young hobby mm-hmm. they've only been around for basically the last like 500 years 
um, as an art. So that actually is quite young compared mm-hmm. to a lot of the yeah, ones yeah. we've talked about that are literally ancient forever. Yeah, like Egyptian time, yes, Roman times. Yes, exactly. But miniatures have always been around. Mm-hmm. Specifically, there have been miniatures found in the old world tombs of the Egyptians Mm -hmm. 5,000 years ago. Yes, I know that. (laughs) Yeah, and these little tiny miniatures were carvings from wood, stone, you know, brass, and they were made for the decedent, which is the person who passed away, Mm -hmm. to be able to take to the afterlife with them. And these miniatures would come to full size and help um, and help them in the afterlife. And so they would make replicas. Uh, they would have them made replicas of their family members, servants, pets, their favorite foods, mm-hmm. uh, you know, their alcohol, a lot of things mm-hmm. to take with them to mm-hmm. the afterlife to have to keep them comfortable and happy. And with the families, I was interested. I was like, do they like, does that mean the family members come to life for them in their afterlife or when the person passes, they get mm. to be together? So that's something I'm like, I have to mm-hmm. I have to look it up now. <laughs> so yeah. it's really interesting we went to, to the king tut exhibit when it was out in um la yeah and that was really cool c- to see like little dolls or whatever mm-hmm. like all these little things that yep. are just so pretty and they're so well preserved yes so you can how old they are yeah and it's funny because they would even make little dioramas um if you don't know what a diorama is um for us in the united states i'm sure it's called something else somewhere else um they're just little boxes that depict scenes mm-hmm. of something i um, remember having to do that in elementary they school were my favorite <laughs> they were I wonder my why. Not favorite <laughs> i wonder why i'm still playing with all yeah. houses now they were my favorite and if i could do a report in diorama form i absolutely did i would <laughs> always so um no i'd rather write it really yeah oh god i didn't want to i got a really good uh grade for um it was for the um the organ trail yeah. And I had to write up a journal entry um, as part of a big project. And I. Like a pioneer? Mm hmm. Nice. And I stained the pages. I did uh-huh. it in my nicest cursive. Yeah. And the teacher likes it so much. She was like, Can I save this for examples for future oh, classes? And I was fun. like, Okay. I think it was in junior high. I always did a craft. <laughs> I still do now. So I'd can... rather write something than. Yeah. I than would absolutely. Paper craft. It's not <laughs> yes. my thing. So, um. Outside of this, miniatures were pieces that were made for ritualistic offering types of things throughout history, but not dollhouses. Mm. So just miniatures in general. I'm not going to dive deep into that. We know what a miniature is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's tiny. It's part of it. Yeah, exactly. It's anything that is shrunk down and, uh, and, and made into a miniature form of itself. Mm-hmm. So we are starting between the 1500s to the 1600s so it's the 16th century Mm -hmm. and they are called baby houses now not the word baby like we think of like a baby doll house baby for a miniature version of a real house House. yes okay yeah and they were essentially a model home of what your version of ideal would be okay and so imagine like it's like a three-dimensional visual board Mm -hmm. and sometimes they were exact copies of their houses with the ideal furnishings and things that they wanted or things that they already had Mm -hmm. and they were extremely pricey and to the point where again as most of these only the wealthy could afford them Mm -hmm. and they were a status symbol. And some of these dollhouses, it was not uncommon that they were the entire value of a real house. That is crazy. Not a f- super fancy rich house, but like the Just, person's modest house for yeah. the time. And I know it is really crazy. So they were they were used as an art piece, but also, again, it was like a fun way you could like rearrange your furnishings to visually have mm-hmm. a representation of how you can rearrange and redecorate. And I like that, too. Yeah. My (laughs) brother does like that on the computer. Yeah. Like that one guy. See, we all like that one guy on on TikTok or whatever on Facebook where people have like issues in their room and he will have little little model things. Yeah. Yeah, He puts it together so that you can utilize the most space possible. Mm -hmm. So my brother did that for his room and then for Troy's room when um, 
he got the bigger bed mm-hmm. and helped like well your desk could go here this could go here you got space yeah. here and and so yeah instead of yep. building we've it, always it's just, done it. yeah it's so funny <laughs> right we do and it in a technology forward way yes, now we move forward uh-huh. from it so um these baby houses were more like a, a big cubbied cabinet that would have table legs. They were tall enough that you wouldn't have to crouch down mm-hmm. um, because also they were big enough that they could be kept out of the hands of children. Mm-hmm. They were not meant for children. Yeah. These were That's not so toys. I know. Because now it is. Yes. They were not, well, not toys. Always. And so they were high. They were high up table legs. And imagine like an armoire that is open and has different little cubbies in it. And each mm-hmm. of these is a different room. At this point in time, there's no real uniform scale. That's the term that's used for dollhouses, which is scale. And um, I will get into that. But a, a, the super common one is, and the easiest, which is the one that I'm building, is a one twelfth scale. So that is one inch or 2.45 centimeters is equal to one foot which is like, I could, it's weird. It never comes out right. It's like 30 centimeters. Yeah. I always get confused with those with um, Lincoln's monster trucks because they have the scale. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, this is, we got him something for his birthday. Yeah. And I was like, this is smaller than I thought, but I'm like, but I don't get the ratio, like the the scale. Like, so it's confusing. So that's it. That's the best way to think about it is like, if that monster truck is 10 feet tall, Mm -hmm. it will be a 10 inch tall monster truck. Yeah. So it's just one foot is one inch. Okay. So that's a one twelfth, and that's the most common. And I'll get into a couple mm-hmm. more later. So at this point in the 16th century, there, like I said, there's no scale to these. They were just made to be as detailed and beautiful as possible in a small scale to take up mm-hmm. as little room as possible. And <clears throat> the the earliest baby house i love that term it's so cute <laughs> the earliest baby house you gotta in, call it that from now on uh, yeah I'm exactly working on my baby house working on my baby house <laughs> <laughs> that sounds weird too it does. <laughs> the earliest baby house in documented history um was from 1557 and um when we say documented it's like they had the receipts mm-hmm. <laughs> um it's in 1557 and it took an entire year to complete which is actually not that long mm-hmm. um so that's like some work put in mm-hmm. and it was commissioned by albrecht fifth albrecht the fifth the duke of bavaria okay and um and it was it was made for him and um it was exactly what we think of or as i have just explained it's like just a big dollhouse and mm-hmm. it the replicas were super interesting because they were not only just made to be um exact it was exact details down to the pages mm-hmm. of the book mm-hmm. so these weren't just like stuff the pages with blank paper they were as a handwritten book mm. it was a handwritten book okay. and and that was what the libraries filled their fake library with it was mm-hmm. next level yeah <laughs> bougie <laughs> um nuremberg germany was called also called the toy city and it's the mecca of german toys in the 16th century and i just that's like so long ago we've Mm -hmm. always loved toys and they were uh coined for making the first what i called a room box and it was called a nuremberg kitchen Mm -hmm. and it was a single box and they had um a kitchen set up oh. and so everyone was different and so it was just like a really beautiful fancy kitchen and these were the first ones that were touted as like a toy an item oh, that could be okay. a toy and their first two were gifted to the princesses of saxony um dorothea and anna they were only five and ten years old and mm-hmm. they were in love with them and they started to come into fashion more mm-hmm. as a toy not an adult okay. collector's uh-huh. item So each early dollhouse was an art piece and they're made by master craftsmen. Like I said, we're not talking just like me (laughs) putting together a dollhouse that's been punched out for me. Uh These are architects and they're using math and measurements and they start building these houses. Each of them is one of a kind. But during the Industrial Revolution, which changes everything in every facet of these crafts, we're talking about mass-produced paper, mm-hmm. mass-produced fabrics and dyes and spinning and all these things. 
the industrial revolution changed them and then you're like but was it for the better because Mm. it always roughens it it's not the same and this is when manufactured dollhouses started being made okay um they were massive so many toy companies had popped up throughout germany and england and they're making these dollhouses now Mm -hmm. and during the 19th century the toy manufacturers moved to making some dollhouses here in the usa but again that's not that long ago that's still recent enough yeah. to me it's mm-hmm. interesting and after world war ii you know a lot of things changed for everyone and these doll houses were using less resources and they are now being made out of tin they're called tin lithos and it's looks like a big lunchbox house it's metal mm-hmm. and the pictures are stamped on the inside this oh, is the okay. first design of this and so Mm -hmm. the whole facade of the house and the windows everything is printed on Mm -hmm. and it will have cutouts and it will have stairs but these are all printed Mm -hmm. and so your pieces that you added in were added to but you couldn't change the Mm -hmm. wall structure bookcases were printed on the kitchen could be printed on and Mm -hmm. that's common in dollhouses now too yeah but they weigh a lot more Mm -hmm. so um these things were becoming really cute and really modernized. But again, it's it's after World War Two. Not everyone in every anywhere is doing great and dollhouse sales start to decrease. Mm-hmm. Um, back into a little bit more of some scale now, because uh, I'm going to start talking about dollhouses. So it's going to help you. One twenty fourth scale is um, one foot actually is only a half an inch in size. And so we, that, that scale is quite small and you end up talking, they sell these kits on like, you know, Amazon, the 124th scale, and that is too small and fiddly for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I cannot make miniatures in 24th scale right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I I do uh, 12. Mm, One sixth scale is going to be Barbie size. Okay. And so one sixth is like, it's a half and a half. Mm -hmm. So, um... And the craziest part to me, the tiniest scale is one one hundred and forty fourth (laughs) scale. This is a dollhouse within a dollhouse scale. We're talking someone writing your name smaller on a grain of rice with the, um, you know, because they had big magnifying loops Uh back in the day for jewelry and crafts and Mm -hmm. watches and things like that back then. And they would have to pop those on. And people still make these today. And I see them in my craft groups. And I mean, my arm has issues. So that, that kind of fine detail, I have. I have grip issues that will make me tremble trying Mm -hmm. to grip. I don't have a strong strength. It's something I need to work on from a surgery I had. And, um, and also I just don't have a desire to do it that small. Yeah. Good for people that do. That's amazing because your dollhouse should have a dollhouse. Yeah. But that is just too much for me. That's like lace, um, crocheting and the tatting, the the little itty bitty hook. It's like, uh, no, thank you. That's too small. It's literally the hook on the end is like, Hey, my tarantula claw is that long. (laughs) It's really teeny tiny. I can't do teeny tiny stuff. (laughs) I, mm -mm, me neither. So, uh, Queen Mary's dollhouse in 1924 was designed by a lead architect of the time. His name is Sir Edwin Lutienes, I believe. It took him four years. And this is so bananas to me because, again, somebody in one of my craft groups was had just gone here to visit and they were really upset in my miniature group Mm -hmm. they were really upset because it was closed but they were really nice and Mm -hmm. asked politely and they were able to be let in they were like yeah it's no problem you can take as long as you want Mm -hmm. and so it's like a free tour yeah um it's in windsor castle Mm -hmm. and so i thought that was really cool but then they got in trouble because they took a picture and you're not supposed to have flash photography because it's so old and delicate Mm -hmm. but also just because it takes away the specialness, I think, if you show it off. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. No hate. I'm just saying. And <laughs> so um, get this. It is crazy. I don't know how. I didn't keep looking into it because we know it has working plumbing. How? how? That's uh, right? crazy. And I'm guessing like I'm like maybe gravity. Yeah. Like a gravity kind of like we're talking flushing toilets and turning on water in the kitchen of the dollhouse. That is weird. Right. And it has wiring, but this is not uncommon. Like a lot. I don't want to get into that fiddliness. I don't plan on it. Mm -hmm. Um, But there are super simple LEDs that that I've thought about. But 
you know, I never want to get into diodes and soldering and all that. It's mm-hmm. too much for me. I want to keep it simple and fun. Yeah. And, but, and so th- this is made with working plumbing and wiring and lights. And I think that's amazing. And this is the craziest part to me. And this is like I explained with the books. Mm-hmm. These only had the finest of items put inside. And the people, two, two examples of people that were commissioned to do works for the dollhouse. One of them was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, uh-huh. which most people are familiar with. But in case mm-hmm. you're not, he uh, wrote Sherlock Holmes mm-hmm. and a lot of other you know, crime novel I literally detective have, works and stuff like that. I literally yeah. have two books right oh, there. Pretty, yeah. <laughs> and so he wrote, they both commissioned and wrote teeny tiny books just for the library. These are like unpublished works. I don't That's know. Crazy. And the other was Rudyard Kipling who wrote The Jungle Book. Mm. And so they both have leather bound tiny one of a kind books in the Queen Mary's dollhouse. That's crazy. In Windsor Castle. And I think that's super cool and weird. But um so anyway, and there's a full library of books in this dollhouse and mm-hmm. I'm desperate to know who made them all. <laughs> so um that could be maybe an update. Yep. But at the same time I have sources and it would be cool to look at them. You should mm-hmm. look at them. Um this dollhouse is um it's kind of interesting because we have another little bit of, um, oh my gosh, my brain, uh, <laughs> differing information. Oh, that yes. You and I come into contact with yeah. a lot. And it's it kind of interesting. And I'm going to get into that at the very end. Okay. So this dollhouse stands at about um, five feet tall or one and, one and a half meters. I will always round, you guys. I'm not going to yeah. be like 1.7352 <laughs> meters. So yeah. it's about one and a half meters. And it has 16 rooms. It took... Um, it took Edwin Lutiana's four years to build it. Wow. And it has had over, um, or I'm sorry, it had over a million and a half visitors in the first seven months of its opening. Wow. So everybody was really excited to see mm-hmm. it. And I'm sure it was publicized that these famous people. Yeah. And I mean, we're talking famous artists commissioned coin size portraits. Yeah. The whole thing, you know, the best textile artist of the time made the couch. That's crazy. This is what we're talking about. And that I find so amazing and fun. Mm-hmm. And like, that's not a thing now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I love it. So um so anyway it is still on display as i just said somebody mm-hmm. was just talking about it and i think there's some kind of um it was closed because there was some kind of renovation doing the front of the building it's like a closed off its own room mm-hmm. which i think is kind of interesting so that's still in windsor castle that's cool another well-known dollhouse um this is my favorite my mm-hmm. favorite um colleen moore she was a silent um movie actress and she had this monster of a dollhouse built for her by her dad it was nine feet wide that is two and three quarter meters wide Mm -hmm. and the tallest tower of this structure of the house is 12 feet tall (laughs) which is 3.7 meters tall that's crazy that is taller than our ceilings. I know. I was just going to say, I don't think our ceilings are that <laughs> no, tall. No, they're not. I think we have 10 foot Yeah, ceilings. I think so. <laughs> so old house. <laughs> seriously. Really old house. The interior. Now, this is like, you know, I, I've i mentioned it before. I do taxidermy and mild types of mummifications and wet specimens that I'm not like really, uh, I'm not super good. And it's, um, you know, it's dead animals. It's mm-hmm. sad. So I'm really interested in what this is made out of because it doesn't say. But the interior had miniature bearskin rugs. Oh, my god! And I'm like, were they made of mice? What are they made of? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> so the miniature bearskin rugs and there is art and amazing furniture. The same exact thing. She had money and she commissioned pieces. But she also created a lot of them herself. She mm-hmm. had a lifelong love of. That's hard to say. A lifelong love, love of these dollhouses yeah and it was one of her favorite accomplishments and she worked on it all the way up to her death Mm -hmm. constantly adding and removing and it was so big now get this there is um 
God, this Instagram post. I'm like, how many pictures do I put in? <laughs> so I'm going to have to work that out. But I really do want to put in a picture of it. And I will. So what you will see in the picture is like all the gold. That's real gold. Really? It is not paint. It is yeah. real gold. And it has an estimated value today of seven million dollars that is insane right so Freaking this <laughs> i was telling you this when we were sitting down doing our research together mm-hmm. remember i had told you the I was conflicting like, information i or? no no oh, i was oh. like i found something so good that i'm gonna add and the way it ties in to our vibe is too perfect you'll hear it as soon as we get to it oh my gosh is it i know <laughs> i i have a good guess is it okay Frances Glessner Lee. She was born in 1878, and she created something called Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death. She was the first female police captain in all of the United States. So oh. she's already, like, tough. She's a badass, mm-hmm. and I love her. She's amazing. And she helped. She was one of the founders of the Department of Legal Medicine at Harvard. Uh. And what this was is the blossoming of forensic science. Mm -hmm. And so forensic science is opening up. And, you know, as I've mentioned in my Victorian crimes, they knew fingerprints. They Mm -hmm. knew how to look for crime evidence. They knew this and that. But we didn't have a lot of empirical evidence to Mm -hmm. to go on. And so she was part of that in the beginning for at least the United States. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that she noticed was that training was lacking and this is something that happened in a a big case in britain that everybody knows about jack the ripper there was crime evidence that was messed up Mm -hmm. um, not taken because of their women's positions in life Um, and so because they didn't have training you were just hired yeah hey i need a job i'm a cop yeah like that's Mm -hmm. it and so because of this you know we're talking the very early 1900s she started Mm -hmm. this career young in her life Um, she knows something needs to change. And the route that she decides to go to, she goes back to her youth and she decides that she's going to start making dollhouses. Mm -hmm. And these types of dollhouses, she knows is going to be made for training. She's an incredibly talented artist and she's been making these dollhouses since she was a kid. Mm -hmm. And this plan, she has started to curate these room boxes and they have the most perfect accurate amazingly painstakingly made details to the point of was the door locked was it Mm -hmm. unlocked is the Mm -hmm. latch open on the window is the light switch up does the rug look like it was wrinkled but then spread back out again Mm -hmm. and all of these things she made Without scale, because it didn't matter. Yeah. But it was essentially in a room box. I'm all with my hands. <laughs> I'm like in a room box that's maybe like an 18 by 18. Mm-hmm. So it's a good visual. It's bigger. So, you know, because people are going to gather around. And they're going to look at this. She was amazing. I mean, she made the bullet hole. She painted the bodies. She mm-hmm. painted the corpses, the entire crime scene, every single thing down to the letter. And then she also made... Um, made up scenarios. So, yeah. um, you know, to help these solve these crimes, they were like a mm-hmm. riddle, and she was just a genius, and I just love it so much. So, she, one of the things because she did these all herself. So again, we're kind of going to go back to these teeny tiny details. Mm-hmm. She hand painted letters. If they had junk mail, she took a single horsehair and she painted. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> she painted the letters. She mm-hmm. painted the books. She used two straight pins to knit socks. What? <laughs> and I was just talking about yes. the tiny. I could yes. never. Nope. And so for, if never. you don't know a straight pin, a straight pin is used in pinning your clothes for patterns or just pinning them because you need to do a hand sew mm-hmm. really quick. They're like an inch and a half long mm-hmm. in centimeters. That's about three and a half centimeters. And they have a little tiny nail head on the end and they look yeah. like a miniature knitting needle. That is crazy. She knit needle. She knit socks. That's <laughs> and that's, I love it. She rolled tiny hand rolled cigarettes with rolling papers, oh my gosh. tobacco and lit the end. She meant Business. seriously and i love it because yeah. like 
the attention to detail oh for sure so because there. it's important to her yeah because it is important because mm-hmm. what if that cigarette was from the car the i mean you and i have read articles of like the criminal left his wallet behind yeah he left his facebook and it was logged in uh-huh. so what that cigarette could have been by the person that committed uh-huh. the crime they left it there after they cleaned up and they forgot their cigarette so yeah. all of these things are important and i love that she even handcrafted, which is crazy to me. I see people do this with clay work. Um, they will like cut up old pop cans and make molds and cutters, like die cutters and mm-hmm. stuff. She made a hundred percent functional locks and keys. That is crazy. Because like, where would you buy that? Uh-huh. Like, I can, I have dollhouse locks and keys, uh-huh. and they're teeny tiny, but they're not functional. Mm-hmm. I think the smallest lock and key I have that's functional is like, you remember those little shitty ones from our journals? Those little girls, you could just pop yes. them open. Avery has one for yeah. her. And I'm like, I have something. one for probably like a train case that has yeah, makeup I think, or nail yeah. polish. Yeah, that's what she has it for. Yeah, that's the smallest I've ever seen that work. Mm-hmm. So that just blows my mind. And again, you got to remember. We are talking, this is like the early turn of the century. She mm-hmm. starts getting this idea. She started working in these processes. So she started designing the nutshells. That's uh-huh. what she's calling them. She starts designing the nutshells in the beginning of 1940. So not only is she hand forging tiny brass locks and painting letters with a single horsehair and knitting saw i'm just never gonna get over it that's crazy. she's in her 60s that oh my gosh i can't even do that now the dexterity my yeah. the joint pain i have it's like woman oh. and i find like that's amazing to that me. is I think crazy so cool and she is um she's been tout- touted as being a genius too and i'm like don't mm-hmm. blame her I, I don't blame her i don't, <laughs> don't disagree with disagree, that at yeah. all and so her nutshells were such an, I love saying that her nutshells, <laughs> um, her nutshells were such an immersive and amazing, useful tool um, that, because they could interact with it. They uh-huh. could lift up the rug and see, was there a footprint? Is there one uh-huh. tiny drop of blood that you uh-huh. didn't notice that's left behind? These were meant to be handled. Yeah. So they are still in use today for teaching at the office, the office, <laughs> the office of the chief medical examiner in Baltimore, Maryland. Huh. And they're only taken out during like um, seminars and stuff because mm-hmm. they're art pieces. They're yeah. glorious, but they're so useful. And did you know, is this what you thought I was going to yep. talk about? Yeah. yeah. And it's so amazing. And it's funny because when I was doing this, I was like, holy shit, I yeah. have to. It's like our crime, our crime. Yeah. And I was so <laughs> I have goosebumps. I <laughs> I love it. It's magic. And so I will post a picture of that. Too. Yeah. Now I have just a couple little, a little things coming on after here. I Googled it. Um, and I Google. <laughs> so, um, the most expensive dollhouse, because that's $7 million dollar doll. <laughs> Let me tell you something. <laughs> that $7 million dollar dollhouse is not the most expensive. Oh my gosh. The most expensive dollhouse is called the Astolat Dollhouse Castle. It's valued at, and now, you know what? I did not pay attention, but I don't think it was a new article. And with inflation, the way things have yeah. gone crazy. Yeah, um, it could it's, be valued more. Yeah, it says it's worth about $8.5 million or Gosh. about 6 million pounds or 8.3 million euro. It has 29 rooms. Wow. What? I mean, like servant rooms and like what? What are you talking? I don't know. Twenty nine rooms. It took thirteen years wow. to build completely. Wow. So from nineteen seventy four to nineteen eighty seven by the artist Elaine D. Hell, mm-hmm. and it has. I love this. This is. I want this to be me. Ten thousand individual handmade miniatures wow so in the same fashion you know every single book is handmade Uh it's not like like i've made a library for the room box um, Mm -hmm. that i had made and what i did was i had a little scribble stamp that was like it was like a love letter print or something but it's Mm -hmm. like illegible Mm mm-hmm and so I just used that a million times in different colored inks and I trimmed out every single page and I did front and back. I did a lot of printouts and stuff. Uh-huh. Um, my sister and I hand bound a few tiny little books, like so uh-huh. we sewed the signatures and everything. And, um, but I didn't go that far. I mean, I wasn't mm-hmm. handwriting pictures and stuff, but even that was like 
a full day to yeah. do one miniature book was like a full process. I can't yeah. even imagine. So anyway, sorry, 10,000 handmade individual min- miniatures for these 29 rooms. And it weighs just around 800 pounds. Whoa. <laughs> or 363 kilograms. And it takes up 30, 30 square feet. That's crazy. 30 square feet, which is about 2.75 metric squared meter squared sorry wow for metric yeah and that's just ginormous that's Uh like the entire room this whole room yeah is the base of this dollhouse and so it's like her life's work and one of her best favorite accomplishments and Mm -hmm. um i love that so much so here is the conflicting information and because i am an american citizen i'm not saying this to be an asshole it's just i understand the pride of country Uh uh-huh there is so when you Google it, Queen Mary's dollhouse is said to be the record for the biggest dollhouse. But I just told you this dollhouse takes up an entire room. Yeah. Queen Mary's dollhouse did not. If you remember the specs, I told you yeah. it's only five feet tall. That's not that big. Uh-huh. And it's up. And it only had 16 rooms. Uh Yeah, it had working plumbing and wiring electricity. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of a dollhouse with plumbing. Yeah. (laughs) But then there's other evidence that actually only says it was three feet tall. Hmm. And so actually this conflicting evidence says that it is I it's Elaine DLP I'm so sorry her name is spelled D I E H L I'm like deal deal let's make it's a deal. deal that's the Elaine same deal yeah D I E H L yeah yeah that's deal that's the same nice. last name as Troy's orthodontist <laughs> <laughs> oh, see there yeah. we go <laughs> so it is between Eileen DL or Colleen Moore, from what mm-hmm. I think, and either way, they both have big, big, big old houses. Big, yeah. And so here comes in the thing: like they're claiming it's the biggest, and it's not, mm-hmm. not even close. So yeah. I'm like, I think it's just the pride of country they wanted. Maybe. Just, yeah. And so because I'm like, I'm not talking like one or two up like sources. It was a lot. So yeah. it's like, what is going on? I don't understand. Um, because that was like the official page. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, um, I don't know. <laughs> it must have been cold that day. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I've i always loved dollhouses. And I remember as a kid growing up, um, our library, the upstairs. It was a really big library now that mm-hmm. I think about it. The upstairs was, well, it's the capital. It was the capital of Oregon. So yeah. it was a large library. Um, it, the whole upstairs was like, the kids area Mm -hmm. so all the kids books were upstairs um and then there was like a fun i think it was called the discovery room or something Mm -hmm. and that was amazing and had a lot of fun stuff and there was a dollhouse there Mm -hmm. and i would get lost in it every time as much as i loved the discovery room it had bowl table Mm -hmm. and everything i loved it but that dollhouse i would just stand there and it was in a glass cabinet and it was lit up and stuff Mm -hmm. and i would just like (sighs) peek my face (laughs) in and like cut my hands because seriously as cliche as it sounds there was something new every time yeah there was something i didn't see because in reality i was only standing there a few minutes and then it's like elaine we gotta go and i'm like Mm -hmm. And so I've loved them forever. And it's funny because I feel just like those people in the 16th century, even as a little girl, um, when I played Barbies with my sister, we didn't really play Barbies. We just played Mm -hmm. like, let's set up their space. Uh (laughs) And so it was like the scenario. And so it was just like setting up. I didn't ever have a Barbie dream house. Actually, I didn't have a big doll. I didn't have a big one. I had a fold up one. Yeah, I did like three rooms. I didn't have one. What I got would be like the play sets that had individual bits. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, at the point it was like a grocery store. And so we would painstakingly set up like the display and everything Uh like and that was totally my jam. (laughs) And because my sister and I are very particular hashtag Virgo. Mm we would be like three hours later Mm -hmm. and we haven't played Barbies once. (laughs) All we've done is set it up and that was the goal. Uh And I realized that like, there's nothing wrong with that. We Mm -hmm. were still using our imagination. And so, yeah, I love miniatures. I love setting them up Mm -hmm. like that. And um, I am so excited for the one I'm doing right now because I have it Mm -hmm. like all planned out in my head and I'm so excited. 
<laughs> these fucking windows would just come together. No, I just talked about that for like fifteen. Well, we did talk for ten we minutes. Did. This is the longest craft I think I've done in a long time. Yeah, I um, but the little biography was yeah like, added to it. I it out. took um wood shop in high school, yeah. and our final. I remember telling you our yeah. final was to like build a house, you know, to a certain scale, mm-hmm. and um, it had to be up to code. So like you had to have your An firewall architecturally yes. sound. Arch- yes. Oh my god, it's so and cool. And we had to do all the shingles on the roof and everything and um leave walls exposed so that you could see your beams and all of that and mm-hmm. it was really fun we worked as a team it was like did you guys have to wire it too no it was just the structural gotcha. like integrity of the building I up to that. code did you and have so... to take the brunt of the work um <laughs> <laughs> you paused <laughs> well i was the only girl there were, i was the only girl in that class um oh my actually, god no. i was the only girl in my wood shop class too yeah i actually yeah i was i was the only girl and so my, it was, we were broken up into teams of four mm. and, um, and so it was me and three other guys. And so I'm pretty, uh, I pretty much took you the planned lead. It out. I planned it out cause they executed the yeah. plan. So it was like, Oh, I'll work on this. And I was like, I'm all work on the shingles. You're not going to fuck it up. Yeah. <laughs> so, but we did good. We, we aced the project. We got, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's like that, that meme have you, I'm sure it's so morbid, but it's like, you know, um, when, <laughs> When I die, I want to make sure that my past group members lower me in my casket so that they can (laughs) let let me me down down one more time. (laughs) (laughs) I have seen that. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm a natural leader. Um, I, I. I'm a natural zero conflict. Please don't punch me. I'll do your homework. (laughs) Yeah. I, I got it done. That's cool. But we all worked together. That sounds like a really fun project. It was really fun. We all were into it. So I just made sure that like it It got done in time. (laughs) You know, mm-hmm. we weren't messing around too much. Do your homework, Bobby. Yeah. So, but it was fun because we only had time during class to work on it. Yeah. So you really had to work. So we would get in on, like, we'd get in. Yeah. The, two of the guys would go and grab it. And the other, mm-hmm. like me and the other guy would get all the materials. So I essentially built a dollhouse. I built a tiny house. You totally co- did. To code. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Because I can tell you most of these dollhouses are not. To code. But yeah. I did mention, though, that they were made by architects back in the day. Mm-hmm. So there is probably not the outside, but I have a feeling probably the inside is. Because mm-hmm. they're going to build it like they would design a house. Because yeah. they were house builders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Sorry, everyone. Did well, you like it? I did. It was really good. <laughs> you could tell I got into it. Yeah. I was like, this is my jam. <laughs> Yeah, it was, I could see why you got into it. Okay, so uh, this is a long episode, but that's fine. I don't even know what day this episode comes out on. I think it's around Thanksgiving time. Either mm. the week of Thanksgiving or the week after. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's episode 32. That's all I know. Gobble, gobble so, if it yep. is. There you go. Happy Thanksgiving if you are in the United States. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I always forget. <laughs> Who I'm knows? Like, yeah, well. I know. <laughs> okay. So, on to the crime. Boo. Okay, I'm so kidding. I am going to do the case of Carla Brown. Ooh. So this takes place in 1978 in Wood River, Illinois. Mark and Carla moved into their first home together. Both of them had actually grown up in Wood River, and so they knew this is like the place where they want to, you know, live. Yeah. Um, they weren't married yet, and so I think this is in the 70s. Living in sin. Nah, I'm just kidding. It's very, it wasn't really common for couples no. to move in before they got married no. in the 70s, but they did. Um, nice. Carla was very independent, kind of a free spirit. My kind of lady. Yeah. She had two older sisters, so she's keeping up with her sisters. Mm. So um, she was 22 years old, and um, she was going to college at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. And she was also waitressing at IHOP, the nice. International House of Pancakes. I've been craving pancakes. Really? Sorry. Not yeah. me. <laughs> Shut up. I don't have a sweet tooth. <laughs> so Mark was a little older than Carla, not by much. Um, he was actually an apprentice for construction. So he was doing construction work. He was actually a little slow to commit, like fully commit and settle down. You know, he's young. But eventually they decided to move in together and make things a little more official. And Hmm. Mark proposed to Carla. So they're just starting their life. So the day after they move in, this is June 21st, 1978. It is 1124 a.m. And Mark leaves for a construction job. And Carla is home alone. She had actually taken the day off work and she was going to use the time to unpack the house, you know, get a little more organized. And um, 
so during this time she gets a call from a friend and they're making plans to um, get together later that day maybe for dinner and there was a loud knock at the door and Carla you know quick finished up the call and answered the door Hmm. so then six hours later Mark comes home from work along with his friend Tom and Mark wanted to show Tom you know the new house and also get some help moving some heavy furniture that was still in the truck um, you know, just finish up, you know, guy stuff like here, yeah. come over, check out the house, probably have a few beers and we'll mm-hmm. move some furniture. So when Mark walks up to the front door, he notices that it's unlocked, which he didn't like, you know, just that's weird. Um, mm. So Mark is then looking for Carla throughout the house and he's calling her name, no response. So then he's like, well, she must be in the basement. So he starts to head down the stairs and mm. he finds blood everywhere. Oh, God. Cushions on the couch were moved. And the TV trays were on the floor. Um, It looked like there had been a struggle. And then he finds Carla. Um, She is um, in a barrel of water, face face up to her waist. Her hands are tied behind her back. Um, So this is a big 25-gallon, like, bucket of water. Mm -hmm. And she's, yeah, in in the water. And so he immediately pulls her out. And Tom calls 911. Mm Mm-hmm. It's clear she's gone. Um, yeah. But Tom tells police, like, send an ambulance because they don't know. Yeah. Um, they can still try. Yeah. You know, in that moment of panic, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, my gosh, I don't know what happened. This it could have just been, happened. Exactly. It could have been a second yeah. ago. And I think they can revive you up to, like, six minutes with not as much brain damage. Mm-hmm. But it, it's it's inevitable. But they it's, could still try. Yeah. So, of course, Tom just sees this hat. No, I'm yeah. going to call. So runs upstairs because mm-hmm. this no cell phones. You got to run up to the <laughs> landline, yep. you know, and call the cops. So police arrive. And of course, Mark is absolutely hysterical. Um, you know, he, they just started their life. They got engaged. Seriously. They moved in together the day before. Isn't this like the third one you've you've killed me with? Freaking these people all happy. Yeah. And they're Everyone's not always happy. happy. Mine are so, all child murderers, apparently. <laughs> well. Like cutting people up and throwing no, them in the river. No. No. The, no ribbon. Mur- <laughs> the ribbon, the river. No murder Sorry. is nice, no. but um, yeah. So, uh, police are you know trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. So both him and Tom are trying to give the police as much information as they can. A uh, crime mm-hmm. scene technician was called to the house, and the police worked to s- secure the crime scene. And uh, so the crime scene technician shows up, starts taking pictures of the scene and mm-hmm. looking around for evidence. And there's no so- uh, there's no sign of forced entry. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's clear that a struggle occurred and it started on the couch and then looking at Carla's body it was clear that she put up a fight she Good. was feisty yeah. there um, were two men's socks that were tied around her neck in a knot mm. and her t- like I said her hands were tied behind her back with um, like an extension cord mm-hmm. it says electrical wire extension cord uh, she's naked from the waist down and she has a large gash on her forehead a cut on her nose and a large gash on her chin and the cause of death was strangulation from the socks that were tied around her neck. They were actually socks from the house. They were in the dresser upstairs. That's where they would have been. Her fiance's socks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, so the cause of death was, um, you know, strangulation. And they were actually, the socks were so tight around her neck that they had to be cut off. They couldn't just be loosened. Mm-hmm. Um so, of course, police start to look at the people closest to yeah. Carla. And Mark was looked at as a pot- potential suspect. But mm-hmm. Ma- Mark had an alibi. He was at work 20 minutes away. Yeah. And he never left at any point And his co you know, co-workers can mm-hmm. cooperate this. Uh, police then go to the neighbors and see if they heard anything. And, you know, this is a crime that happened during the day. So yeah. they're like, someone has to see or hear something. Uh-huh. The house next door to Carla and Mark's house was owned by Dwayne Conway. And he said that he and a friend were sitting on the porch most of the afternoon, and they didn't know of anything that happened to Carla. And so in the search of the neighborhood, they, um, you know, they actually find the woman who used to live in Mark and Carla's house. She said that that day she was driving by with her grandson. She had to take him to a dentist appointment. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she used to live there. And so she's like, oh, let's just drive by the house. And um, she said that as she was driving by, she saw Carla arguing with a man who had long hair, maybe a beard, that afternoon. What a coincidence. Mm-hmm. And even the grandson was saying, like, in the episode I watched, he was like, what are the chances? How often do you go to the dentist? And, yeah. like, Once you know. Once every six months. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that they were like, okay. So then they find out about that phone call with her friend mm-hmm. that, you know, said that there was a knock and stuff. 
And people had tried to call Carla after she had talked to that friend. And of course, they were not answered. So this puts the time of death just six hours before her body was discovered. So Mm -hmm. that means time of death is around noon. Now, remember, her fiance left at like 11 something. So um, detectives then look at a group of her group of friends for any other potential suspects. Mm -hmm. And the first person they looked at was a local man named Jack Myers. And Jack and Carla were acquaintances, and all of her friends knew, like, Jack had hit on her, and, you know, and -hmm. she always rejected him. Carla was really pretty. Yeah. Like, really pretty. So, of course, she got hit on, and her sister was like, oh, she'd even get phone calls sometimes. Like, people, yeah. Mm -hmm. She was just really pretty. And um, so, her friends were like, yeah, maybe Jack was the one that did it, because Mm -hmm. he actually had some uh, incidents of violence with women. But he took a polygraph test and he passed. So then they looked at her, uh, Carla's former uh, stepfather, Joe Shepard, and he was known to police, didn't have the best record. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it looks like, oh, maybe he's a good suspect, but there's nothing linking him to the crime. So they're just like, we have no idea. So June 28th, 1978, this is one week after Carla's murder, Mark. You know, asked his brother-in-law if he could go to the house with him to get some things. And it's really sad because it's like, he just didn't want to go by himself. The brother-in-law was like, it was really creepy going in, you know, walking down to the basement. You're trying to just moved in, but then it's this horrible thing happened. So at this time, you know, this is a week later, detectives are looking at the neighbor, Dwayne Conway, and his friend, John Pranty. They know that there was obviously a violent struggle. And these guys were just sitting on the porch close enough to hear if something was happening. So they are both asked to come in and take polygraph tests. Mm. John Pranty passes the polygraph test and is ruled out as a suspect. Dwayne Conway was so upset. He was just like fidgeting. Couldn't they just, it was inconclusive. They couldn't yeah. get a real read on him. That so would be me too. And it would suck because I'm like, I would be innocent would, and having a panic attack. They know that. Yeah. And so I, I think understand that's why it's like, that, it's inconclusive. Yeah. We can't tell. Cause he can't relax. <laughs> yeah. So two weeks later, there's no progress that I'm can be made in the right case. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I'm sweating because I know what's happening. Yeah. Um, so two weeks go by. There's still no progress. There's no lead suspects as to who would have committed the, the crime. And around the time, this is was interesting. Around the time of Carla's murder, there was a string of home invasions and rapes. Oh, God. That the department was like dealing with. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the Wood River police chief actually resigned when it was discovered that he withheld 14 reports of rapes attempted rapes and sexual assaults over the last 16 months what keep your numbers down i guess yeah because it'll make it look like Mm -hmm. you're but and they're all unsolved or most of them unsolved so maybe the ones that he couldn't because it'll look bad Mm -hmm. bad for the department so shortly after her murder there was a break-in and sexual assault that happened just two blocks away from carla and mark's house and an arrest was actually made Hmm, good in this case and it was a man (laughs) named tony garza I know it sounds like a made-up name, but his name's Tony Garza. He fesses up to some of the break-ins and assaults, but said he had absolutely nothing to do with Carla's murder. He did fit the description of the man who was seen arguing with her the day oh, she so died. so long hair, maybe a beard? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Like Just a tall guy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so um, two of Tony's cellmates told detectives that Tony had told each of them that he killed Carla. Oh, wow. But the description of the crime didn't match up, like, with the crime scene or any of the facts. It's just, like, he probably got all the information so from, like, like, yeah, brag about that? in prison, you know, and try to look all tough. Mm-hmm. So he was cleared as a suspect, and there are no new leads or suspects in the case, and unfortunately, the case becomes cold. Mm. So then in 1980, a new state's attorney was elected, and his name is Don Weber. And he immediately, on his first day, went in and got all the information there was from Carla Brown's case. He was determined he's going, he remembers her case, Mm -hmm. said he never forgot about it because she reminded him so much of a girl he went to high school with. And so he was like, we're going to figure this out. So the first thing he did was he assembled a team to increase, like, the resources available to help solve the crime. Yeah. And one of the investigators actually had a connection to someone in the FBI named John Douglas, who was working on psychological profiling. Now, remember, this is back in the 80s. The psychological psychological profiling is fairly new. Yeah. He's interviewing these serial killers and mm-hmm. stuff, and, and he is really perfecting this art. 
Mm-hmm. It is an art because, man, I don't know how he did it. So and th- keep your cool, too, and be friends. Yeah. Like, be friendly to get information. Oh, yeah. But he was really good at his job. So he was asked if he could take a look at the case, and he agreed. He gave a very detailed report back on what their suspect is like. That's so crazy. When he looked at the crime scene photos, he asked one question. He was like, was she feisty or was she docile? And they responded back with, she was feisty. Mm -hmm. Uh, Clearly, she put up a fight. Uh, He was then able to create this profile. He said it was a white male between the ages of 25 and 30. He was living or visiting within one or two houses of the victim. Oh, wow. He was in the Navy. The specificity. I know. (laughs) It gets crazy. So he was in the Navy. He had some kind of electrical practical experience. Hmm. He was a loser with women. (laughs) Uh, He stayed around the area for about a month, but then left the area. And then he said that he was driving a beat up car, either red or orange, probably a Volkswagen. How does he get that information? I have no idea. (laughs) So he then told investigators they needed to really hype it up in the media because the killer is complacent and thinks he totally got away with it. So that if it's brought back up in the media, then the killer, he said, the killer will call them because he's so obsessed with the crime and the investigation. He said that when the killer calls, he is going to try to play it down that he is a witness and doesn't want to become a suspect. Mm. So like, I saw something, Mm -hmm. but I don't want you to think I did it. Yeah, I'm calling from a payphone. I'm Mm going to hang up. (laughs) A few weeks later, one of the crime scene investigators meets with the forensic expert who is invest, uh, investigating crime scenes with a computer by enhancing the images. Uh-huh. <laughs> so this is 1980. Mm-hmm. Very new uh, technology. So he takes a look at the photos from the crime scene and he notices bite marks on Carla's neck and her collarbone. So these bite marks had actually not been found, which is weird, by detectives or at autopsy. So they now had this big piece of new evidence that could hopefully, like, narrow down the suspect list. Yeah. And so this is when they decided to exhume her body in order to examine the bite marks. How do you miss that? I know. Sloppy police work. I think they were just in over their head. There wasn't really a lot of, like, murders, <laughs> you know, in this area, in this small town. Yeah. Um. So detectives, you know, asked the family for permission. They agree. So... They re-examined her body after she was exhumed, and mm-hmm. now the pathologist is saying that Carlo did not die from strangulation. She drowned. Oh, come Once on. again, how do you miss that? Yeah. Water in the lungs, she drowned. And usually, well, yeah, because she was still in the water, right? Mm-hmm. They pulled her out. He yeah. pulled her out mm-hmm. of the water. Okay. Because I was like, there's usually like foamy when you drown, mm-hmm. but she was in it, so it wouldn't have gotten yeah. to that point. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So now with this new cause of death and the psychological profile, investigators are looking at, like, all the suspects, Mm -hmm. the initial suspects, again. Of course, the two people that had been closest to the crime scene at the time of her murder were the neighbor, you know, the neighbor Mm Dwayne Conway and his friend John Pranti. So... Remember, John passed the polygraph test. Dwayne didn't. Well, he was freaking out too much. Yeah, he was freaking (laughs) out. So Dwayne was brought in for questioning, and he, of course, said he had nothing to do with her murder mm. and while detectives are investigating or interrogating Dwayne Conway while they're talking to him a phone call comes in and you so want to know what it said this man said I was a witness to this <laughs> but I don't want to be considered a suspect mm-hmm it's exactly just kidding <laughs> exactly he's yeah. like i'm just messing with no yeah no it's exactly what the psychological mm-hmm. uh, you know analysis he knew said. It was gonna happen so investigators then took a look into john pranty further and one of the things they looked at first was what kind of car he drove at the time of the crime <laughs> well he was driving a beat up <laughs> red volkswagen squareback just what the psychological profile said this also, um, the bite marks were going to be the evidence of whether or not he, you know, was connected to this. Yeah, dental record stuff, right? They don't yes. they did that? Yeah. So, but in this case, it's the killer's teeth on her. Mm-hmm. So the bite mark impressions, you know, on her skin that's still pre- preserved, mm-hmm. you know. And so they take dental impressions of both Dwayne and John. Mm-hmm. The bite, and they like yeah, try to and, line them up. Yeah? Yes, yes. So they like do the little like line it up on the picture uh, and yeah. see. Um, so the bite marks uh, or their impressions were gathered, and the bite marks match John. Mm. So 
That... So old Mr. Spazzy Pants is innocent. Nope. Yep. Yeah. He was just nervous. He's like, yeah. what the heck? I, will I originally <laughs> thought like, well, it's inconclusive. The is the... So yeah. this guy clearly, I don't know how he passed a polygraph test, but he passed the polygraph a test. A lot but, of crazy people do. But his teeth match the bite marks on Carla. Gross. So apparently friends said that John was able to tell them certain details about the crime and the crime scene that would only be known to the killer. Ew. Details such as the barrel of water and the hands tied behind her back that was not known to the public. Uh, apparently, according to his friends, John didn't accept rejection from women. He was a loser with women. And the profile that John Douglas created about the killer was obviously, as we could hear, spot on. It's yeah. John. So the theory is that John Pranty went over to talk to Carla Brown with the hopes of maybe like some sexual encounter or whatever hit on her. Of course, she rejected him. And then that's when maybe they argued outside. I'm sorry. Is he actually a neighbor or he visits? No, he's, I, it's Dwayne. his friend. Yeah. Dwayne lives next door. Yes. Dwayne okay. owns the house gotcha. next door. Okay. Um, so obviously the argument outside is probably when she's mm-hmm. rejecting him. Then mm-hmm. he snuck in and attacked her in the basement. So, yeah. like, she just went back, oh, probably didn't lock the door. He just waltzed right in. A lot of the times back then, they didn't. Yeah. Um. So, the idea is that he thought she was dead when he put her into the barrel of water. And the scene looked staged, like, in the fact that the barrel was out of place. And, uh, yeah, it's it was just odd. But the psychological analysis was so accurate with the uh, electrical experience from the electrical cord. Mm -hmm. The knot used to tie her hands behind her was a knot known in the Navy. He was in the Navy. Uh, The profile is, like, spot on. So the bite mark was the one piece of evidence that they could use Mm -hmm. to convict him. So a forensic uh, dentist testified at trial that the bite mark was consistent with his teeth. And now bite mark evidence is not very common now. It's not a solid um, sound um, piece of evidence that mm-hmm. that can't just be the only thing but I mean we know other big cases were like you know they're bite marks mm-hmm. and people have very distinct like if you have a weird tooth you know yeah. you could see that in a bite mark you can also alter your teeth though mm-hmm. if you know and I that think you left a wound you could knock some out you could mm-hmm. be crazy and pull one out like Get some braces you know, yeah <laughs> you, know, you can file a couple down uh-huh. you could do yeah so don't um, get any ideas people jeez so he obviously was trying to fight that yeah. the dental you know the dental impression shouldn't have been used against him but it's like mm. dude you were right next door right when this happened mm-hmm. so in 1983 john pranty went on trial for the murder of carla brown and he was found guilty of first degree murder and was sentenced to 75 years he continued to maintain his innocence <laughs> And in December 2019, after serving less than 38 years of his sentence, John Pranty was released from prison, and he still lives in Illinois. And then I found something interesting when I was looking him up, like, okay, so he served a sentence. He still yeah. is like, I'm innocent. I didn't do it. You know, whatever. It's clear you did. Right. Especially that psychological profile. Mm-hmm. That was, it's like, wow, that was That's so scarily bananas, accurate. Yeah. Um, and on January 24th, 2022, at about... 2.30 a.m., uh, John Pranty was charged with DUI and disregarding a stop sign after he crashed his car. So he had another run-in with the law. What a dingleberry. And yeah, so he's What just, a shitty person. But So the reason it was such a short, because it was like there was no irrefutable evidence mm-hmm. technically, because that's weird. I really thought that bite impressions were like final because it seems like it would be. Um, it's they'll take what they can get, right? They, yeah. And so in this case, it was in the eighties, and he was closest to the crime. He fit the profile. He um the bite the teeth. I don't know. I didn't really look if his teeth were all jacked up, if he was missing mm-hmm. some or whatever. Yeah. But his teeth matched, and it's just it's like you were right next door, and. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he was, like, talking to friends about the case, obviously, and they're mm-hmm. like, man, I wondered why he knew all that. Well, it's because he did it, and he was right next door. I bet you he probably killed her. <laughs> and when his friend went inside or went on a beer run or who knows, mm-hmm. who knows how it happened, but he, yeah, he did it. And um, and if he didn't, then that would be a really crazy coincidence that his teeth would match he has the same car he was in mm-hmm. the navy he had electrical experiences like all this all this stuff i don't yeah. know i don't know it's they did their best with what they had which we yeah obviously but it know. was it was that um state attorney or mm-hmm. whatever he just yeah but yeah having all those details that helped for sure but it's mm-hmm. just i'm like again because the reality is 
the like in his mind let's say Mm -hmm. he's innocent he could lie and be like well the real person that did it told me all of this yeah. if he wanted to so it's still shit but then it would have to have no direct evidence to him mm-hmm. you with know with his so. teeth mm-hmm. so yeah so that was it was a pretty simple one wow. but um straight pretty straightforward i'm glad that it got reopened and it didn't just remain a cold case because it yeah. very well could have and it just took a couple of years i'm glad it wasn't one where it was like 20 years later um mm-hmm. because then the bite mark compressions probably would you know think about how if i don't know yeah, like you said, your you teeth, teeth change, change a lot yeah. from that point to that point. I know it was like, I swear, as I get older, my teeth seem to be getting more crooked. <laughs> I know, mine. Which That's is so annoying. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Like, I've had all four of my wisdom teeth removed, too. So technically, mm-hmm. I should have had more room for, like, adjustment. Mm-hmm. That's what they said would happen. They're like, yeah, you'll have more room for adjustment. And, like, I got a little snuggly tooth on the mm-hmm. bottom front. And yeah, they I'm thought here. that one would, like, like turn yeah and i'm like it's worse now as an adult so what weird. is that weird why <laughs> but Our bones getting old and crippled and deformed yeah. okay so well that was that was, that was a good job it was sad. yeah it was sad i'm like uh, it's it's really sad the how staged then. crime was like overkill because if mm-hmm. he hadn't done that part she maybe could have lived yeah yeah because she yeah died from drowning now he could have held her under the water he I don't know. But then I'm like, how did Dwayne not, mm-hmm. unless Dwayne was nervous because he was covering yeah. up, like, mm-hmm. he knew or something he just, was up. D- like, his friend just disappeared. And yeah, and he's like, like, comes back and maybe has some blood on him. How often do I leave your house? And I'm just like, I'll be back. And then, like, I don't come yeah. back because I get distracted <laughs> yeah. or something. Or, like, I come back a couple hours later. Like, mm-hmm. so if that's, like, a normal thing that they did, he was probably like, well, he just left. Like, yeah. you know. And, and maybe he didn't go back. or I don't know because mm-hmm. he said that they were drinking beer sitting on the porch like all afternoon so maybe he was like i'm gonna go pick up some blow or I'm some gonna go smokes pick up some or whatever or something. yeah so go i gotta grab another case then, of beer and mm-hmm. and if he just knows? went quick enough into her house if it's not locked you're not gonna need to knock and stand mm-hmm. there or ring the doorbell and so it could have been a quick attack yeah so um but yeah anyways well sorry to so why on a sad note but <laughs> and it's gonna be the weekend and everything i know that's yep, okay i'm ready so okay well with that stay crafty and not cry me bye, bye.